This is CSAP Science and Policy Podcast, where we're bringing you the latest evidence and expertise to improve public policy making. This week, we're proud to present the ninth episode in our series on science, policy, and pandemics. This episode is brought to you in partnership with Cambridge Global Food Security, Cambridge Infectious Diseases, and the Cambridge Immunology Network. In this episode, our host, Dr. Rob Doubleday, is joined by Dr. Jean Adams and Dr. Jag Sorai for a discussion about food insecurity and supply chain resilience in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome, everybody. I'm Rob Doubleday from the Centre for Science and Policy. I would like to introduce Jean Adams, who works on food as part of the MRC Epidemiology Unit, looking at sort of public health questions of food and diet and understanding that sort of systemically. And Jag Srai from the Institute for Manufacturing, which is part of the engineering department. And Jag looks particularly at, um, comes from a background understanding supply chains and digitalization of supply chains, but is um, interested very much in food systems as well. So today we're going to talk about food insecurity and supply chain resilience. So both Jean and Jag are part of the University of Cambridge's Global Food Security Interdisciplinary Research Centre. And and we're very grateful to you both, Jean and Jag, for joining us for this conversation. So if I might start with you, Jean, thinking about the spotlight really that's been shed on food insecurity in the UK during this period of social distancing, both in terms of interventions that public policies had to make whilst people are being shielded or while supplies have been interrupted and kind of raising up the political agenda of the awareness of of food insecurity and food poverty. What do we know in terms of data, in terms of our understanding about the state of food insecurity in the UK now? And and how does that compare to sort of longer running Mm. situation? So one of our problems perhaps in the UK in this space is that we actually don't have a great deal of longitudinal data on prevalence of household or adult food insecurity in terms of people who report uh, not having enough money to kind of be sure that they'll have the food they want um, consistently. But in the last few years, we are starting to have um, some nationally representative data that finds that before the pandemic came along, that maybe about 20 to 25 percent of adults were reporting either concerns about food or actually experiences of skipping food or not eating um, balanced meals because they couldn't afford it. More recently in April, I've totally lost track of time recently, in April, um, the Food Foundation and YouGov did a survey of more recent experiences of food insecurity and they estimate from that that Prevalence amongst adults have maybe gone up by three or four times, but they included in that not just financial lack of access, but lack of access because people couldn't get out of the house or lack of access because people couldn't get the food they wanted in shops. And most of the increase they attribute to those um, new experiences that were pandemic really specific, but But we also know that just um, lack of financial resources is a major source of food insecurity and is a major increasing problem in the last couple of months. So I would say a problem that has existed for a long time, we're not properly measuring it, haven't been doing so until recently, and probably exacerbated by recent circumstances rather than is new to this the last few months. And in terms of policies that we've seen implemented to to cope with the pandemic, you know, and that's included, you know, having to deal with things like, you know, kids not getting free school meals that would have otherwise got free school meals, people being told to shield themselves and having to rely on provision of food from various sources. What what's your comment in terms of of your understanding of of food as part of the sort of public health story about those interventions? You know, have, have they helped? Are they good? Are, you know, could they be better? What can we learn? Yeah. So yeah, I think that there are certainly at least two things going on. So more than a million kids in the UK are eligible for free school meals normally because their families are claiming benefits or for other kind of low income reasons. So there has been a a number of attempts to replace those, mostly with food vouchers. So families are offered 
a voucher for £15 per week for every child that they have that would normally be getting preschool meals at school that aren't. I've read lots of reports of just that system not really working. So, you know, you make a request online and you get sent a code and then you have to print a voucher and all sorts of delays and codes being sent, codes not being accepted by supermarkets. So the system clearly has a lot of glitches in it. At a basic level, that seems a good idea to replace what could have been, you know, that's often kids only hot meal is their school their free school meal so clearly some attempts have been put in place to deal with that but have not got there yet there's also a kind of a a separate strategy to deal with people who can't get out of the house or to help people who can't get out of the house because they're shielding people who are considered medically very vulnerable to covid are offered if they can get help from anywhere else from friends or family to deliver groceries to uh they're offered a a food box, which is delivered by local councils or organised that way. Again, that seems to kind of be working. The food looks really uninspiring. And we've had chats in our research group about what would the meals be? And it's difficult to know. But there is certainly, I think, food getting out there. How good are the data sources that, that you're drawing on um, to, to, to make those statements? And you know how how... Yeah. How reliable are they and what, what could be done to improve them? So at the moment, the kind of UK strategy to measure food insecurity kind of long term is to include it in something called the Food and You Survey, which I think is a couple of thousand. I'm not 100% sure how big it is, but it's uh, repeated annually. And we have one wave of food insecurity data from that. But our understanding is that that's going to be repeated annually. The YouGov survey that I mentioned that's looked at food insecurity in the last few months uh, was 4,000 people. And also there are kind of uh, other ad hoc research studies that have been done. There are also kind of often a few thousand. And most of these all make use of the same survey instrument, which is um, was developed by the US Department of Agriculture. And it is really a kind of a worldwide standard for um, assessing food insecurity and allows us to compare to a, across the world. So I would say they're large enough and representative enough to be able to start to make estimates from. I'd like to now to turn to Jag, if I may, and ask you from the point of view of understanding supply chains, just how would you sort of characterise, maybe take a few minutes to characterise the kind of the immediate crises that we've seen in relation to food supply chains and put that in a little bit of context in terms of medium and longer term perspectives? The first point of the crisis you know, was manifest in a conversation around lockdown. And in the debate very much surrounded about when to lock down. I know that was uh, very much the conversation in the UK. And, and I think uh, very little conversation, and whilst that was very legitimate, very little conversation took place on how to execute a lockdown. And I think this has you know, very interesting uh, forward policy implications for you know, future responses. And so, yes, the debate on when great needed to happen, but how was uh, somewhat... Um, sidelined. And I think we tended to work our way through it. And if I sort of describe what we saw in the UK, you know, initially, this was mainly about you know, pasta and rice shortages in our supermarkets. Uh, but if we went into the main retail stores, we saw a, a stock out pretty much right across the board. And, and we did a reflective piece, which was around, was this stock out, you know, a panic buying from uh, consumers? Or was it actually something we ought to have expected? Uh, because we know our retail supply chains have, you know, an operate on a very tight, you know, couple of weeks stock uh, at best um, and, and less for perishable foods. And if we send a policy uh, communication about, you know, let's shop, you know, less frequently, inevit inevitably that inventory is going to be uh, pretty much used up literally overnight. And, and at the same time, you know, going back to the policy on what to shut down and lock down, we saw our restaurants and fast food and businesses close, initially due to you know, insufficient consumer demand as people were asked to stay home. But even those who were supplying food to the home had problems with uh, staff absences. The whole e-commerce last mile delivery capacity uh, being completely overwhelmed. And even, even to this day, our shopping online for perishable foods. And there are, in many areas, no delivery slots for weeks on end. That was the initial uh, type of conversation. And, and so we tried to have a little bit of, you know, what were the interesting responses here? You know, one thing I identified was how the smaller retailers seem to be more flexible, uh, maybe even better informed than, the, than some of the larger ones. 
the, the word of mouth, which now tends to be word of WhatsApp, WhatsApp uh, communications, uh, actually was being highly uh, effective, both in, in the UK, but also in ports and trying to understand about availability of labor at our ports and how our ports were operating. And then going a little bit further, we saw that you know, uh, in order to mitigate this initial shortage, uh, government stepped in with some uh, collaboration amongst the big retailers. In the UK, as half a dozen big retailers represent 80% plus of our, uh, our shopping, it's pretty easy to get them in a room and start to have some uh, collaboration. And we saw that in terms of some trade relaxation, in terms of shared infrastructure uh, and access to urban environments uh, during the working day and in the evenings, which is normally very restricted in the UK. So that was a, a very short term activity. And, and this sort of conversation around you know, was it panic buying or hoarding? But if you look at a, a system with only one or two weeks stock and we're asked to shop infrequently, I, I suspect this is more about intelligent buying versus panic buying. And surely, surely there was some panic buying as well. Products that were typically hoarded were, were, were things like uh, rice and pasta, which is the ones that really stocked out. If I, if I jump onto your, your second sort of area around medium and long term, one of the things that uh, we've been looking at it, uh, in our research is the emergence of new e-commerce last mile delivery channels. Uh, and these are some of the usual suspects who have been involved in uh, last mile delivery, but also uh, some that were simply established within the last three months. So I'm getting my food on an online platform that's pretty slick, really efficient, uh, that's being purely run by furloughed workers who are trying to make uh, ends meet. And, th and that's amazing, a functioning supply chain within weeks. Um, now, of course, it's the last mile. Uh, and there's several examples of that. But as we think further ahead, some of the issues around harvesting our food crops, uh, the high dependence of casual labour or migrant labour in the UK, but also internationally. And we saw this week the Pick for Britain conversations kicking off. And it just shows how dependent we are on, on labour uh, in, in the food supply chain. Academically, this is interesting for us because typically when a supply chain breaks down, we think about the, the ripple effect or the bullwhip effect as things propagate through the supply chain. But in a crisis that we've seen here, we've seen multiple fractures in the supply chain. So we've seen the last mile delivery to the consumer break down. We've seen supply to supermarkets break down. We've seen the harvest activity breakdown. So this poses really huge challenges for the supply chain. And I think there's a real revitalized conversation about essential industries and sovereign capability that I'm seeing across sectors. And this is the conversation I think now hits the food policy community is, as we know, in the UK, 50% of our food is imported or thereabouts. A large element is exported. And, and so what happens when uh, international trade stops, when the ports are mothballed? And so what does that mean in terms of sovereign capability going forward? And plays very nicely into the, the global food security initiative that Jean and I are representing here, as well as our own departments, is rethinking food supply chains, for me, requires a better understanding of the interdependencies internationally, not just on materials, but on having uh, workforce flexibility, and, and what does this mean in terms of future technology investments? I just want to turn back to Jean to, to react to some of the sort of points that Jags raised, and particularly thinking about not just sort of supply of sufficient calories as the, as the end of a national food policy, but the quality of, of diets, and whether you see there's a risk that that kind of conversation that we had seen some progress on may be downplayed a little. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there is. I've been thinking about this recently, that there, I think there's often a feeling that when we talk about that kind of simple energy in energy out makes obesity formula it leads us to conclude that obesity is a problem of gluttony of people eating too much and in fact I think probably it's more likely a problem of eat, people eating the wrong things and one of the reasons they do that is because they don't have access to the resources that would enable them to eat different stuff or better things so we find that um, people who experience a kind of financial related food insecurity are much more likely to eat a poor quality diet and be obese. And that's 
probably because they're focusing their purchasing on cheap but energy dense food that makes them and their children feel full. And there's lots of data describing how healthier diets are more expensive. So I think there is a risk that if you focus too much on just getting people enough calories, you build up a a health problem for the future. And that's kind of come into really stark focus recently with the findings that COVID mortality is associated with diabetes and obesity, that there's really acute reasons why we might have wanted our population to have gone into this experience a little bit healthier. But obviously, there's also long term reasons why we might want to keep the population healthier in terms of making the NHS able to deliver on what it needs to. So I, I think we probably do need to look to the kind of short and long term on that. And I was thinking yesterday that it's it's really reminds me of that Boer War experience where acutely we realised our population weren't healthy to deliver on a demand placed on them that was unpredicted. Can either of you tell me a bit more about the parallel supply chains for households and restaurants? Has bridging those supply chains been difficult? Because I know there's a whole question about, you know, what should the end of public policy be with respect to, for example, takeaways? And- there's two or three observations I can share with you. Uh, restaurants that were operating at a more local level, many of them fast-tracked uh, an, e- an e-commerce delivery channel. Uh, one or two weeks of we're going to have to shut down, uh, quickly migrating to this isn't going to be sustainable for our business. So some restaurants permanently shut down. Others uh, migrated into an e-commerce platform. And that's one of the the thoughts which which struck me was the speed at which that had happened and the professionalism of of how that happened. So the technology is here to bring in uh, new partners who can take over delivery, platforms that can engage with consumers literally within a two or three weeks. I mean, it's something you would expect a year or two for somebody to set up a, a new channel like that. I've also been in contact with a major multinational, one of the biggest in the world, and their food service business fell off a cliff edge. And one of the benefits of that organization is they have multiple channels to market. So going back to resilience, if you're in a single channel conversation and that channel breaks down, you're really exposed and there's nowhere else to go. So one response is to operate another channel quickly, or a key aspect is to have a a, a multi-channel or omni-channel strategy, not just for the retailers, but for the food producers. And and maybe the, the, the final point I'd like to make is just more broadly on digital platforms. What's amazing about this new technology is it's highly scalable. You can bring in new partners very quickly, both on the supply side and on the uh, distribution side. And it's a very flexible uh, platform if properly designed. I've also come across a few organizations which had very rigid structures and highly centralized that struggled. Digital platforms per se aren't an answer to, 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 to all these uh, uncertainties, but it's maybe the way they are constructed. Jean, what's your recommendation for how mm-hmm. we think about fast foods as part of a food strategy? There has been a kind of a growing conversation, maybe over the last five years, about better regulation of the takeaway sector because it tends to serve less healthy foods and um, in some areas that can be the only food that's essentially available. A kind of a piece of geeky background is that under normal circumstances, um, if you don't serve takeaway food as your main business, you need planning permission to change to doing that. And in March, as part of the original coronavirus emergency bill. That requirement was temporarily waived for 12 months. So there was clearly an early decision made. I suspect that we needed to provide food to people who couldn't leave the house and that was takeaway food was considered a kind of an essential part of that. And I think that 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 conversation has changed a bit more recently that this is about enabling economic activity in a whole um, sector that's been somewhat decimated but I think early on it was it was really thought about in terms of a food resilience and I mean I think that's an an interesting point that we think that takeaway food is a, a core service that we need to provide to people but I think in the longer term again that there is a risk that this undermines quite a lot of the policy that had come before about trying to shape healthier and um, local environments and that we find it hard to um, roll back from that expansion of takeaway and delivery. Uh, just picking up on some of Jag's points, like, so platforms like Just Eat and Deliveroo 
I've interestingly seen a number of media reports recently that they're they're struggling. And I think that that's partly related to their business model, that they take a big uh, cut from uh, the restaurants that are providing the food. And I've increasingly come across much more informal ways of doing that organisation of ordering and either collection or delivery via WhatsApp or other things like that. And so I, I'd agree that I've been incredibly impressed by how quickly people have innovated and used available technology to do things differently. What evidence do we have from this pandemic period of governments intervening in supply chains to preserve national supply? And is there anything we can learn from that about future policy planning for resilience in times of crisis like this? So in terms of you know your exposure, there's, a, there's quite a lot of uh, data available uh, through a sort of input-output analysis uh, method on you know, what, what, what is surplus and exported and what is uh, imported. So we, we do have very good data on the, the flows in and out of the UK, I guess. I think what's, what's a little bit not so clear because of this uncertainty on harvest is you have your expected production volumes and your expected output. But actually, that could be uh, very much under the threat due to these various supply chain failures. And so it's certainly, I think, a little bit early to uh, work through the implications of that. One thing I was that worried me about the medium and long term um, was around, you know, when I saw the largest producers of wheat, Kazakhstan and rice, Vietnam, put export bans on products, you know, the biggest producers in the world, slapping down export re- uh, bans and restrictions in the first few weeks. You know, it does sort of pose the question is uh, where, where the rest of us will feature uh, if the big players uh, sense an exposure. Even, you know, if you take India as a context, there's a lot of interstate trade, you know, if you if you think about the interstate dependencies. And again, uh, uh, you know, you've got the uncertainties of what is going to be harvested in a timely fashion, what's the, uh, what's the dependency on labor and resources to, to harvest, and this whole issue about storage. So I would say we have seen those uh, export bans and we are starting to get, uh, you know, we could look at past data to look at exposure, but I think it's crucial that we look at it within the specific pandemic context because the, the numbers will be uh, somewhat different. But Jag and, and Jean, actually, just to go back over the ground in terms of, from your perspectives, you know, how would you say that the UK did fare? Because, I mean, I think, Jag, you're saying that, you know, that there were short-run issues which have been resolved, but there's still some kind of longer running uncertainties. And Jean, coming back to you just again to talk about, it's not just quantity of calories, but but how we understand kind of... Well, yeah, that's my impression, that there were short-term disruptions that appear to mostly have resolved. We're not necessarily doing well in getting food to our most vulnerable populations, but that's not necessarily because there's not food available to give them so that I mentioned things like free school meal vouchers that it's more about getting um, systems up and running to get resources to people for them to go shopping getting labour to um, to crop clearly is also a problem in the UK and is kind of compounded by the whole issues around Brexit And and that does come back to this issue of kind of quantity versus quality of diet because uh, as I, I mentioned, that healthier diets tend to be more expensive, driven by the cost of fruit and veg mostly. And that's my concern, that these issues of um, lack of labour is going to lead to further increase and diversion in the prices of the healthier versus the less healthy food. And that um, compounded with kind of loss of income associated with kind of economic, wider economic problems, that, that that's going to lead to an overall uh, decrease in diet quality, which is associated with all sorts of health outcomes, but I suspect also more polarisation across the population of people who just can and can't afford to eat well. I mean, how do we think holistically about food? I mean, this has been a big question over the last few years, and it seems that the importance of that question is just been 
illustrated, but I'm not sure we're any closer to, to coming up with answers to how to think holistically you know, in terms of public policy about food. If we are agreeing that there is a role, or perhaps a renewed role for government, whether to take a sort of narrow national view or whether government to act sort of in the national interest in a more internationalist way, it still seems to me the big question is what is the objective? What is food policy really trying to achieve? Is it trying to achieve so many different things simultaneously that it's just going to be impossible and needs to actually be disaggregated? Or is the only hope to have a more holistic joined up approach to food? Yeah, I think probably you won't achieve all the outcomes that you need to unless you think of um, all of them at the same time. Like if you just work on health, you'll get health, but you might not get environmental sustainability, right? So I think that you need to think about achieving healthy, affordable, sustainable food systems simultaneously or else we'll be going around in this circle for, you know, 10 years for each outcome. And there are, you know, some of those things align. Healthier diets do tend to be more sustainable. The problem is that they're not necessarily affordable at the moment. So, like, I think that we can, it, it's not unresolvable. It feels complicated. But if we keep a focus on that sort of thing, then on those kind of small number of core outcomes and I think that you could work to achieve those things. And from the point of view of your research what would be the you know areas of action that you would like to see prioritized or developed from here? Yeah you, you keep talking about policy and I'm unsure about I mean it, it seems feasible that we have experienced some incredibly interventionalist policies recently and that might mean that that becomes more acceptable and we go forward with more kind of structural changes to the food system rather than relying particularly from a health point of view at the moment we rely on kind of education and motivational messages and I don't think that those are achieving what what we need to happen so it may be that we get more used to government and we go for more intervention or I can equally see, you know, we've had enough of government and in the UK, I think you could argue that they didn't necessarily do as well as you could have done in the last few months. And so we want less government. And I can see both things happening. And I guess the challenge is how do we harness the right side of that equation, maybe? Yeah. And in terms of the sort of a research agenda, Jean, what would you to sort of shed light on some of these choices that we're confronting and, and adapting to, you know, obviously there's the political dimension, as you mentioned. Um, what kind of research, what kind of data do you think is most needed to get a, a proper picture of the food system as a whole? Yeah, so that's a good question. And I think probably we do need to think about it as integrated data. So we do have streams, like in the UK, we have a national diet and nutrition survey. We know in quite a lot of detail what people eat. And we have, as I said, kind of a starting to see a time series on food insecurity. But those things are not necessarily integrated with. At, at the same time, do we see stuff on affordability that's closely linked to healthiness of diet and also environmental impact. So I think probably we need to work towards a more integrated data stream, but also in real time that allows us to kind of quickly understand what the impacts of local national change policy is. We're nearly out of time, uh, but Jag, do you have any final thoughts? I think we should perhaps uh, rethink our operating and business models. Um, one of the things we've seen is farmers connecting directly with consumers in that you know, disintermediating. That's been really powerful. We've got better return, uh, more profitability, less waste. It's more dynamic. It's more, uh, more resilient. And, and we're seeing this in other sectors as well. So I think that's, that would be my takeaway. Very nice, Jack. Thank you. And Jean, do you have a final word? I guess from a, a, a health individual level food insecurity point of view, I, I'm really keen that we remember that, that these are not new problems, that they've been exacerbated by um, this acute situation. But even when we get back to normal, we're going to have a lot of people under normal circumstances who can afford to eat well and who are the health is suffering from poor quality diet. I, I kind of feel like these need to be thought of as long-term as well as just short-term problems. Huge thanks to, to Jean and Jag for joining us. I mean, I've, it seems to me that w the question of food just brings into relief almost all the kinds of challenges that governments are trying to deal with in, in their complexity and their scope. And, and it 
very, very interesting to hear their characterization of the situation we're in and their discussion about how to think productively about how we might make progress. So on behalf of everybody, well, thank you very much to Jean and Jag. CSAP Science and Policy Podcast is a production of the Center for Science and Policy at the University of Cambridge. This episode in our series of Science, Policy, and Pandemics has been produced in partnership with Cambridge Global Food Security, Cambridge Infectious Diseases, and the Cambridge Immunology Network. This episode was hosted by Dr. Rob Doubleday and produced by me, Kate McNeil. Our guests this week were Dr. Jean Adams and Dr. Jeg Sarai. You can learn more about CSAP's work by visiting us on Twitter at CSIPOL or by visiting our website at www.csap.cam.ac.uk. If you have feedback about this episode or questions you'd like us to address in a future week, please email inquiries at csap.cam.ac.uk. Thanks for listening.